Our scripture for meditation today comes from Isaiah 58, 1 through 12. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voices like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush, to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil. If you offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continuously and will satisfy your need in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Just less than a year ago today, we gathered as a church with all other churches, praising God and shouting Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Our children danced in the aisles. They waved the palm branches, and amongst them our stuffed Jesus was paraded forth as we all declared together, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. It was a shout of adoration. It was an acknowledgement of Christ's kingship over us. And we set ourselves to follow him. We grasped on tightly to our good and loving God, our Savior who had made a way for us, who despite of us and all we have done and left undone, he came down from heaven lived among us, died for us, and was resurrected so that we may too be resurrected with Christ. Through him, we are secure in the knowledge that we are beloved children of God, that you are loved, that you are forgiven, that you are invited, and that you are welcomed alongside Christ. Not because of ourselves or any good work we have done or could ever do, but because of the love of our God. Hosanna in the highest. Yet today is not Palm Sunday. The shouts of Hosanna are now but a distant memory. Today is Ash Wednesday. The palms we waved, the Hosannas we shouted have been reduced to ash, burned by every act of sin, every act of rebellion. We come and remember today that our own lives are fragile, that we are nothing more than dust, and that to dust we shall return. And in our scripture for today from the book of Isaiah, it's from the tail end of the book, which scholars often refer to as the second book of Isaiah, as it was written much later than the first two-thirds It was written in the time of exile, about 500 years after King David and about 500 years before the birth of Jesus. 
And it's been almost 70 years since the Jewish people have been taken from Judah and brought to Babylon in exile. As foretold by the prophets, the time of the exile is nearly over. The time to return and rebuild Jerusalem is imminent. The prophet knows this, and the prophet remembers the way they lived before the exile. And he sees the way they live now, and he fears for the way they will live when they return. They have lived rather lavish lives. They have gone about their business doing what is best for themselves, and they have built up their own riches. When the day of their fasting comes, they dress themselves in sackcloth. They make a show of it in the ashes, and they cry out to God. But then the next day, they go about their business unchanged. And for the author of our scripture today, they see that the people have a choice to make. Where do they go from here? In researching this passage and Ash Wednesday in general, I came across a painting, a painting from a Dutch artist by the name of Pieter Ertsen, who I think was asking a similar question. It's known as the butcher's stall with the flight into Egypt, and also as the meat stall with the Holy Family giving alms. It was painted in 1551 as a commission for the incredibly powerful and influential butcher's guild in the city of Antwerp to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the lavish guild hall. At this time, it was the most expensive, uh, at this time, the most expensive and prestigious paintings were those of religious uh, design. And so what does Pieter Ertsen paint on his massive four foot by six foot canvas? Well, as you can see, it's a still life of a meat stall. And this may seem appropriate at first, given who commissioned the painting, but at this time, still lifes were considered the least prestigious and the least valuable of paintings. It was undesirable. But yet, this undesirable painting is much more than just a painting of a meat stall. It's a whole sermon in and of itself. We start here at the meat stall. Pieter, like the prophet, sees that we lead lavish lives. We have a bounty before us. We are blessed. You can find just about every type of meat and animal product here imaginable. And yet, as we look over the cut choice, the choice cuts of beef and succulent sausages, we find a pewter plate with two fishes lying in the shape of a cross. It's a traditional symbol of the season of Lent in which we now enter. The cross fishes, though, seem to be pointing at something in the background. And if we follow them up, we see that behind the meat stand is a great number of people traveling. If we look closely, we can see that many of them are poor, destitute, and infirm. And at the center of this pain, we see a family, a man with his wife who's riding on a donkey, holding a newborn son. It's a representation of Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus as they flee from Bethlehem. Though poor and on the run to protect baby Jesus from the execution order of King Herod, we see them stopping to give a bit of bread to the starving as we watch from the abundance of the meat stall. It's an apt image that the prophet reminds us of as well, that we have a duty to loosen the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke, to share our bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them. And as we begin to move deeper through this painting, it is clear there are two roads before us at the meat stall. To the upper left is a road that the people walk, which leads up to a church in the far, far distance. It's a tough and unpleasant road, a road that leads us far away from the wealth of this meat stall, deep into uncertain woods to be cloaked in ash. Yet to the right is another path, one much more comfortable. It's the path of the city streets, where we need not go too far from our meat stall. It's here where we see a man with a bucket drawing it from the well, trying to water down some wine, and yet there is no water. And around him lie a great number of shells, the remains of an indulgent feast, now just rubbish. Beyond him still is a tavern, wherein we find the prodigal son flaunting his inheritance before prostitutes. And hanging in the doorway of this tavern is a stripped animal carcass, hollowed out, emptied, a symbol of death. And above all of this hangs a sign in Dutch that says, land for sale out back, 
154 rods, either piece by piece or all at once. It's a reference to a land sale that occurred in the same year as this painting was painted, wherein the city of Antwerp forced a beloved order of Augustinian nuns who ran a hospital that cared for the sickest and poorest of residents to sell their property at a loss. The city then realized they didn't need the land. And instead of giving it back, they sold it to Gillis von Schoenbrück, who was a notoriously unpopular real estate developer. And suffice it to say that this road on the right is a road of greed, lust, and ultimately death. So here we stand this Ash Wednesday at the meat stall. Where do we go from here? Martin Luther King Jr. asked the same question in his book entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? He says that one day there will be a revolution of values where we will look back on the past and even on our present, and it will be said of our actions, this is not just. The displacement of people from jobs as employers enriching themselves with profit, the filling of people with hate, the wars we wage, the orphans and widows we leave behind uncared for. He said America is heading towards a spiritual death that there is no reason why a country so prosperous and so willing to spend so much on war should refuse to spend money to build up future generations, to supply everyone with a livable income, to remodel the status quo with bruised hands until we have fashioned it into a brotherhood. In reading his words, I am reminded of the words of Cain, the firstborn son to Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. He says, am I my brother's keeper? Words he uttered before God after killing his younger brother Abel. Words I think we still echo all too frequently now. The answer is yes, we are our brother's keepers. As Christians, we have a social responsibility to others, given to us in the example of Christ and in his own words when he tells us to love others as we love ourselves. We are responsible for the poor. We are responsible for the sick. We are responsible for the oppressed. We have a duty as Christians to advocate to the nation for the care of those such as these, to write our representatives, to make our voices heard. Yet we also have a personal duty, one that St. Basil outlines to us in his homily on the Gospel of Luke. In his words, Is God unjust who divided us the things of this life unequally. Why are you wealthy while the other man is poor? Is it perhaps that in order that you may receive wages for the kind-heartedness and faithful stewardship, and in order that he may be honored with great prizes for his endurance? But as for you, when you hoard all these things in the insatiable bosom of greed, do you suppose you do no wrong in cheating so many people? Who is a man of greed, someone who does not rest content with what is sufficient? who is a cheater, someone who takes away what belongs to others. And are you not a man of greed? Are you not a cheater? Taking those things which you receive for the sake of stewardship and making them your very own. Now someone who takes a man who is clothed and renders him naked would be considered a robber. But when someone fails to clothe the naked, while he is able to do this, is such a man deserving of any other appellation? The bread which you hold back belongs to the hungry. The coat which you guard in your locked store chest belongs to the naked. The footwear moldering in your closet belongs to those without shoes. The silver that you keep hidden in a safe place belongs to the one in need. Thus, however many are those whom you could have provided for, so many are those you have wronged. The difficult words of St. Basil, a man who was rich, but who gave it up to serve the poor. But this is the path to the left. This is the path of community. It's a tough path. It's not a path easily walked, but it's a pathway to spiritual life. It's a path that may ask you to give up your time to volunteer at the church, to be a greeter, to help out our weekend food program, to go to Bo Sierra Leone and serve, to take a serious look at all you have and to ask, do I really have more than I need at this moment? It may even require you to acknowledge the call that is upon you, to say yes to it, to stand up, to lead a new ministry, to reach out in new ways to those who need it most. 
or we can go down the path to the right, a path of comfort, a path where we don't have to upend our lives. But it is a path of spiritual death, and it is a path of chaos, one we can see clearly illustrated in the book of Judges, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and it ended horribly. This path is one that is absent of our crucified Christ, and it is a path that beckons us away from the empty tomb and from the joy that it brings. My friends, Palm Sunday is almost upon us, and Easter Sunday not far after. It's today, as the prophet says, just another day of fasting. Is Lent just 40 more days to follow? Is it just about the sackcloth? Is it just about the ashes? Where will we go from here? Will we go and live comfortable lives too concerned with the things of dust? Will we be content with comfort to the point of spiritual death, or will we choose to live in a new fast? Will we say that we will no longer tolerate that there are the poor among us when we are so rich? Will we say that we will no longer tolerate hate and oppression since we are called to love and freedom? Will we say that we will no longer tolerate the evils of this world that allure us since we have been saved from them? Will our hosannas ring out this year for truth? Will we rise out of this present darkness and shine like a light before all people? Will we work to raise up the foundations of many generations? Will we be called the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the streets to live in? Where will we go from here? Which path will we take?